I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day, and we're here in Austin, Texas with Store Magic. Around the table are a group of invited writers and speakers from around the world to ask questions and learn about the products. If you'd like to learn more about our event, just go to techfieldday.com, and you can find many more videos like this at youtube.com slash techfieldday. All right, so what I'd like to do is I just want to talk about our caching. Um, so I, I've, I've briefly kind of mentioned that we have SSD caching and memory caching, but I just wanted to, to drill down in that a little bit more for you guys. So you might understand that SSD is faster than disk, but you know, <laughs> I'm just going to go over it a little bit. So you know, we, we have a number of uh, storage mediums that are out there. The, the favorite ones to talk about is the SATA and SAS. You know, uh, this is particularly difficult in or, or not the best for virtual environments because you know we see high latencies from this because of the nature of the disks being mechanical. <coughs> SSDs, on the other hand, really quick, give us low latency, lots of IOPS, but they come with a cost. So SATA, SAS, uh, uh, you get more uh, gigabytes for your money, whereas uh, the, the trade-off with SSD is you get less gigabytes, but you get the performance. And on top of that, you know, it's quite common now to leverage uh, the internal memory of servers, which is there for caching as well. So the importance of this, uh, just, to, just to touch on the subject, is in a virtual environment, you're going to have a number of uh, virtual machines on top of your hypervisor. They're all going to be generally sharing a same storage subsystem underneath, and they're all acting in contention to gain access to the storage, you know, serve me, I want this right operation. There's a lot of contention there. When you're using uh, spinning disks, you've got the seek times on the disks. Um, we see high number of latency. But with flash arrays, yeah, we get fantastic response times. But the reality is that flash is still more expensive than SATA. Um, I've seen a number of things where saying, oh, yes, but SSD is coming down so much in price. Why won't you go for that? Well, if I times it by 100, that price difference actually becomes quite a large multiplier. If I times it by 1,000, OK? It may, it may work if you're doing a data center implementation and you're looking at the difference between, say, a $50,000 solution maybe versus a $60,000, $70,000 SSD solution. But with multiple sites, it still becomes quite a large expenditure. So when we're focusing on this, you know, your virtual machines have got a working set of data. So if, if we had a Windows VM with an SQL database, you've got a virtual disks of, I don't know, a, a few gigabytes, 500 gigs, something like that. When you actually boot that VM, there's only going to be a subset of that 500 gigabytes that is going to be frequently accessed. And this is going to be driven by the application. Okay? So in this case, it's going to be our database. We're going to be frequently amending uh, records within that database and reading stuff back. So all of a sudden, that 500 gig could have dropped to just a several gig that is our working set. The other thing to bear in mind, working sets are ever evolving. That database isn't always going to be reading and writing that same bit of data. Things are going to change. It's going to evolve over time. So the important of this is, you know, vendors out there, this is nothing new. What we'll do is we'll look at uh, combating that IO blender effect by introducing flash medium in front of the, the spinning disk. So this essentially gives you the performance of SSD, flash medium, uh, but still being able to have high capacity on the back end by using lower inexpensive drives, okay? So we get the best of both worlds and we get the hybrid model, okay? So the idea of this is virtual machines writing down, their write operations hit our SSD first, you get the low latency response time to uh, the, the throughput that you'd expect. That SSD and the, the software is gonna take ownership of that, and that software is basically going to look at the data pattern line it out as most efficiently as it can, so when it writes it out to disks, those disks don't have to move as much. So we're, ju we're just making it more efficient. So when you're using, when you're using um, well, you have synchronous mirroring between the two hosts, are you using the SSD caching layer on both sides when you're, when you're doing writes? Mm -hmm. So you're writing to the SSD layer on host two if you're writing to host one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so the, for, for writes, we obviously want to ensure it's mirrored. So if you had an SSD failure or a host failure, if we have, haven't, committed those uh, writes down to the disk, you could end up in a corrupted state. Right. Okay. So what we've done is we, we've, uh, sorry, let me back up. So what, we've, what we do is we, we have SSD caching. Um, so uh, writes, as I was saying, are committed to the SSD, but reads are also elevated. So hot data, this working sets, are actually elevated up into this tier as well. And I will touch on that a little bit more. I just wanted to, to set the line there. Um, we also have uh, memory caching. Now, later on, I actually have some customer data 
on what we've done. We've actually gone out and looked at customers. We've got their real-life workloads, and I, I'm going to present that to you. Um, and it's amazing how little uh, memory can benefit these customers uh, between 70-plus uh, percent of their daily reads, right? So our memory caching, though, you know, servers, there's a lot of memory in them now. So what, why can't we just use a small subset of that to actually benefit our workloads? So in our uh, memory caching, we have a number, of, a number of options that you can leverage. From the outset, we use something, it's, I refer to it as most frequently used, it's a little bit more complicated and a bit more intelligent in that, but the fact is, basically what it's gonna do is on a block level on the underlying disk, the more frequently a block is accessed, the bigger the, the, it becomes as a candidate to move up into that memory tier. So frequently accessed data will evolve up into memory and benefit from the, the, the read speeds and uh, all the, the low latency that comes there. Incidentally, memory caching is read only. Now, the reason for that, memory volatile, if we lose our server, we lose our writes, we'll be in a bad place, let's just stick with reading in it at the moment. We also have um, uh, an intelligent read-ahead uh, algorithm. So what this does is it will actually detect sequ uh, sequential streams coming down from the VM. So imagine we've got a number of VMs up there and there's a huge noise, they're all in contention. But what we'll do is we'll actually identify logical block addresses that requests that come in and if they're within a certain window and actually align to each other, we'll notice and identify that this is a potential sequential stream coming from a virtual machine. What we'll do then is we'll actually pre-cache some additional data in that stream. So we'll go, oh, okay, we think that they're gonna read this little bit more. Uh, that gets populated up into memory. If they don't read that data, it just gets dismissed. If they do hit that block, then we're gonna double the read ahead again. And we're gonna keep proactively caching this up in, and essentially what this does is it optimizes the spinning disks underneath and also ensures that the response time on this read ahead happens very quickly. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. The final one, data pinning. So uh, you could use this in a number of applications. Essentially, what you would do is you'd go onto the environment, you'd say, hey, Store Magic, pin this data, hit record. You're going to perform your operation. The easiest example of this could be a VDI bootstorm. Let that operation go through, uh, unpin that data. Uh, then you have that saved. So then at 8.30 every morning when everybody's just had their coffee, that can be elevated automatically up into memory and ensure that that operation every day is accelerated. You can have a number of different pin sets because what we're doing is we're staging that in and out of memory. So you could perform a record of a number of operations throughout the day and then at those times in the day they can be elevated up into memory. So you don't need vast amount, you're, you're choosing what's in there at what time. Okay? Yeah, that is also extremely cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so just to, to reiterate on, on what we've been talking about, so with us, you can use SSD for read-write caching, you can use memory for read caching, or you can use both, so where we will actually create a full uh, three-tier auto-caching solution. A lot of what I've seen at the moment with customers is that memory is the key one for them, just using memory alone. And this affects our customers that are already deployed. They may have got to a contention point that wasn't predicted, and they can just quickly enable some caching and prolong the, 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 the life of their hardware. So again, you know, all we're talking about is hot and cold data. So as data is read more frequently, it's gonna move up through those tiers. So our algorithm is actually intelligent in the fact that it will monitor data over a period of time and that window of time will get adjusted dependent on the change rate. So as, frequent, as data is actually fr accessed frequently and elevates itself up through those tiers, you know, we don't want it to sit there just because it got hit 10 times yesterday and then today it's not being accessed at all. That isn't a candidate to stay up there, it could have been a fluke. So by using basically a moving window, we can actually create um, a time-sensitive a, a time um, point for that data. So as it ever evolves, as I said, you know, working sets are evolving, they're changing, it can be destaged to make space for, for new data that is actually being accessing frequently. So it's not a static, it's very fluid on what's happening in these tiers. Does that then drive into giving recommendations about sizing of the tiers? It does. It does. If you, if you go back to the comments I made earlier, a lot of our customers have two to four terabytes per site. But they were putting in multiple disk drives to try and get the sort of performance they required. So they had disk drives not for capacity, but for I.O. performance. 
And this is allowing them to save significantly on their disk drive cost because they can use larger, lower cost disk drives and use the caching capability instead. So it's quite important to our sector.